Okay, we are back for chapter eight, flight instruments, you know, the six pack for aviators. It's not what you think. Again, we're back, ground school. I'm on my dream journey. I never thought I would go on. Thanks for riding along. Make sure to subscribe down there uh, to my channel, like and comment. I post these on Facebook. I put the links up there for folks to see, but and you leave comments, but also leave me some comments on the videos because those help the YouTube rankings and things like that. So please give us some likes on YouTube and leave comments there as well. These lessons, a lot of times on ground school, can go long. I believe the flight instruments is not quite as bad. You may see the full thing on mine. If I cut any of it out, there's always a link to Jake's CFI channel called Flying Fiddler CFI. And that will have the ground school minus the introduction and closing of me being silly and stuff. Uh, those will be in their entirety. So if you want to do some learning alongside me and see kind of what might have gotten left out that was it key? Then that's where to go see it. Also, we are running a GoFundMe campaign to raise a few funds to get us farther along in our training. And if we raise enough, we would like to get an extra, maybe a 360 camera that we can mount on the plane to get some better footage because we want to take you along on this journey. We want it to look as cool as we can. And I've already got some action cameras. I got some more that I picked up for Christmas and I know Jake wants to buy a few. We may have cameras everywhere, but a 360 would look really cool. So um, anyway, thanks for watching again. And let's dive into chapter eight, flight instruments. Tell us about the Aviator six pack. All right, so chapter eight, flight instruments. Um, these are the instruments that uh, help us to control the airplane. So we have uh, the primary six that uh, Philip talked about are the airspeed indicator. So this is basically our speedometer. Tell us how fast we're going through the let's air. Let's see if I can get them. Airspeed indicator. Yep. Uh, compass. Yep. That's is actually, vertical speed indicator. One of them. That's in the in the usual six. Yep. Altimeter. Yep. I'm on four. Yep. Uh, the ball turn indicator and yep. the attitude indicator. Yep. Are those and the same? You miss the no. Nope, those are different. So you tachometer. Uh, that's. Is that an extra? That the the, the yep. Those are extras. So, I did pretty good. I got five. Yeah, you got you did pretty good, <laughs> and you included a couple extras. Um, Those so, are bonus. so the uh, the standard six that you'll see uh, in sort of uh, clockwise order. Now let's see if we can actually. The chief, they're just kind of wherever though, aren't they? Yeah, back uh, back in the 40s and 50s, they would just stick them wherever they fit. Nowadays, they have sort of a standard uh, format. It's you know two rows of three instruments. That's why we call it a right. six pack. Um, so from the top row from left to right in like you'd see in like a Cessna or a Piper or something, you have the airspeed indicator on the left, you have the attitude indicator in the middle, and you have the uh, altimeter on the right. Then the second row on the left side, you have the turn coordinator, which uh, shows us... Uh, that's the one with the ball in it. The ball and the, uh, the rate of turn left or right, that's primarily used for instrument flying, which is a whole other level of stuff above uh, private pilot. Um, and then you have the directional gyro, which, or the gyro compass, some people call it, uh, because of the fact that the magnetic compass tends to jump around a lot. Uh, you can have a gyroscopic one to, that stays more stable. And then you have the vertical speed indicator, and those are your standard six. So we have a regular standard compass in the Chief. We don't have the gyro compass. Correct. Um, and most airplanes will have the, uh, the... All airplanes are required to have the magnetic compass, like the Chief has. Uh, airplanes that fly IFR, they call it instrument flight rules, so flying the clouds have to have a gyro compass as well. Um, so we get into talking about flight instruments. Uh, are, they're divided into a couple of different groupings. So the first one we're going to talk about is what they call the pitot-static system. Uh, so that consists of the instruments that run off air pressure, essentially, uh, ambient air pressure that comes in from outside. So you have the airspeed indicator, uh, and that runs off uh, two inlets. You have what's called the pitot tube, uh, which takes the air that's coming uh, in, that's the relative wind, uh, and 
directs that into the airspeed indicator. And the airspeed indicator is essentially just comparing two pressures. It's comparing the pressure of the air coming in the pitot tube to the ambient air around the airplane. And uh, you have what's called a static port, which is usually mounted on the side of the airplane. And the reason for that is you don't want air going in or out of it. You just want to sense what the ambient air pressure around the airplane is. So you compare what they call the pitot pressure or the ram pressure to the static pressure. And the difference between those two gives you your airspeed. And the airspeed indicator is essentially a mechanical computer, just uses gears. So the static port on the chief is on the back of the pitot tube right close to it, right? Correct. Uh, different airplanes mount it in different places, so the chief mounts them both together on the same little. Uh, it literally is an mast. aluminum tube. There's, yeah, you know, a lot of planes have got this fancy tube that sticks away. This is just a little tube that sticks out yeah. from the strut on the wing. It looks we'll, like part you'd buy at the hardware store. And maybe we'll uh, snap a picture of the one that we can insert uh, here in the uh, in the video. But uh, I remember way back in the '80s when I wor worked at a factory that built ultralights. Some of the guys that had the, uh, not the swing seat, but they actually had a stick controller on yep. it. They would mount a plastic tube on the down bar yep. that had a weight in it and a, and a hole out front, and that was their airspeed indicator. The yep. air would push that weight up. I'm sure yep. it wasn't as accurate as this, but yeah. no, I thought uh, it was pretty cool that they had this little, it was basically yep. a test tube with a marble or something yep. in it, so that's, and that's how they knew their airspeed. And you'll see that on ultralights where it's, rather than comparing the pitot pressure to the static pressure, you're basically just comparing the pitot pressure to a spring, mm -hmm. um, that, which is essentially simulating the static pressure. And as you say, that's less accurate, uh, but it's a little bit simpler because you only have to deal with one uh, air pre one level of air pressure, one inlet and outlet rather and than two. And on ultralight, it's lighter weight too. Exactly. Which is very important. But the airspeed indicator in the standard aircraft is, uh, once again, in figure 8-1, you can see uh, it's comparing the high pressure air coming in through the pitot tube uh, to the ambient air pressure coming in through the static port. So that's the airspeed indicator. The other two instruments run only off the static port. Uh, so we have the altimeter, uh, which is just a, once again, these are all essentially mechanical computers. Um, so what it has is the uh, altimeter inside of it has a little bellows, which is sealed. Mm -hmm. And the air pressure inside of that bellows, or the amount of air inside that bellows, uh, remains the same. Mm -hmm. And as you, as you climb higher and higher in the atmosphere, the air, the ambient air pressure goes down. The bellows, as you were just motioning, gets bigger and bigger. Expands kind of yeah, kind of like a, a a balloon would as you go up in altitude. The balloon gets bigger and bigger. So essentially, the same thing is happening here. And as it as that bellows gets bigger and bigger, it's geared to the little needles on the altimeter, which go around and around. Uh, and they're show fairly us accurate too, aren't they? Quite accurate. Yes. Usually, uh, the markings on the altimeter are uh, 20 feet apart. Uh, so we have the little tiny ticks here are each 20 feet, and each of the ones that have a number is 100 feet. So usually we can tell our altitude to within plus and minus. And then about there's a small hand that indicates your thousands. Correct. Right? Small hand that indicates thousands, and then some altimeters will have a third hand, which this one actually does have in the figure here, which indicates tens of thousands. Um, so I don't think the chief has one of those. Don't believe it does. No. Uh, the other instrument that's connected to the pitot static system, or in this case connected to the static port, is the vertical speed indicator. So the uh, vertical speed indicator is essentially working exactly the same as the altimeter. The only difference is that the bellows on the vertical speed indicator has what we call a calibrated leak. It's essentially a little pinhole that lets air out at a known rate. So as you start climbing, the, uh, the bellows starts to expand but then the uh, little pinhole starts to slowly let air out of it, so it'll, it'll expand somewhat, but then it won't expand anymore. So as you stop and, climbing, and as you stop that climbing, air pressure stabilizes. Stabilizes, and, and the bellows back. goes back to its original size. And when you descend, the, the opposite happens. It squishes down, and then as you, as you descend, and then as you level out, it 
puffs back up right, because the pressure is not changing right exactly another painfully simple analog device that does its job essentially that's what all this is going to be is just real simple stuff uh, so there's a very good uh, figure here figure 8-2 which actually shows uh, the internal workings of the altimeter that bellows and how that works through uh, gear ratio to uh, drive the hands of the altimeter and the altimeter also has a little adjustment so that you can essentially adjust the hands to compensate for pressure, uh, changes atmospheric the atmosphere. pressure changes as uh, you get high pressure low pressure in the atmosphere uh, as you'd see on a barometer uh, you have to compensate for that. I remember when we went flying the first time in the Chief, you had to readjust. He said, you said, man, this is really low from the last time we flew. Yeah. You had to crank on it a while to get it dialed into the thousand feet. Yep. So particularly in the winter time, you can get some uh, pretty significant uh, air pressure variations around here as you get the, those uh, winter storms that come through and can drop the pressure quite oh, a lot. Yeah. Or you get those nice... Funny, now when I watch weather reports, I pay attention yep. to that pressure a little bit more now. Yep. And uh, something else to consider, of course, is since the air pressure varies uh, with weather systems that come through, um, as you go from, say, a high pressure area to a low pressure area, um, you can get variations in altitude. So if you don't reset your altimeter and you fly from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. Well, if the pressure goes down, it's as if you just climbed higher in the atmosphere and the, the altimeter will indicate higher, so you're actually lower than you think you are. So if you say you're flying along at 2,000 feet and you fly into an area of low pressure, well, now it may indicate 2,100 feet. You think you're at 2,100, but you're actually only at 2,000. Right, so question then. I, that totally makes sense. Yeah. All right, so we're flying across country in the Chief. Yep. We're leaving from Sivrood or whatever the name of that airport yep. is in, in Brooklyn. Yep. We're going to fly to Des Moines, Iowa. Yep. I don't even know if the Chief can go that far, oh, but yeah. I think it probably could. All right. So we leave right after a storm when the pressure might have been low. Yep. Okay. We're flying toward the sun where there may be high pressure along the Mississippi River. Yep. Somewhere along the way, maybe like Mineral Point, yep. are we checking with their their radio yep. to see what the weather is along, and readjusting on the fly. Along the way on a cross country, every once in a while, you'll tune in the weather report from an airport you're passing by and get an updated. So on the altimeter, I know you can adjust it to the altitude where you're taking off from. Yep. Is there a dial that you can actually see the yep. actual and, pressure? And here on figure 8-2 on the right side, you see they call it the Colesman window or the this, That's the actual the bar barometric pressure right. saying 29.95, right. and, and it's very precise. And then you, you dial in, you listen to what it says, and you dial it in on the little dial there. I didn't remember seeing that on the one in the Chiefs. So I'm going to look for it next time. It has there. one. I'm, I'm sure it yeah. does. I just, everything was moving in fast motion. Oh, I'm <laughs> sure. I'm sure. Um, so. so that's, as we talked about, so if we fly from high pressure to low pressure, the altimeter will indicate higher, so we're actually lower than we think we are. If we fly from low pressure to high pressure, altimeter indicates lower, so we're actually higher than we think Which we are. It can get ugly if you're in the mountains or the big hills. Exactly. So what we talk about is there's a saying, high to low, look out below. So if you fly from high pressure to low pressure, now you're you you think you're higher than you actually are, which means if you're if you're lower than you think you are, uh, you may be in danger of hitting towers or mountains right, or towers are always a certain number of feet above ground level right you might be in their range exactly exactly and the same thing happens with variations in temperature so there's this figure here figure 8-3 and higher high pressure air or high temperature air warm air will expand so that as you go up in altitude they talk about here talk, they talk about pressure levels. So uh, a pressure level is sort of an imaginary plane in, in space where all the pressure is the same. Mm -hmm. Makes sense? So as, so if you, you have, kind of like when we were talking about uh, the way a wing works, all these layers of air stacked up. So as you go up in the atmosphere, you have all these layers of air and 
they start at higher pressure and low and get lower and lower and lower and lower as you go higher in the atmosphere, right? So if the air is warm, that air expands and those pressure levels get farther apart. Mm -hmm. It expands and those pressure levels get farther apart. And so in warm air, um, you would be, uh, if you're indicating, uh, let's say we're flying along at 2,000 feet, or what's 2,000 feet on the altimeter, um, you might, in warm air, you might actually, it might be indicating low, you might actually be at, uh, say, 2,100 feet in warm air um, because those pressure levels are further apart. As the pressure levels contract, and you're at the 2,000 foot pressure level, but they get closer together, uh, now you're lower than you thought you were. So if you're at uh, 2,000 feet indicated at cold temperatures, you might only be at 1,800 feet. Uh, and you can actually see this around here in Madison where uh, if we go flying in the summertime, we go up to one of the uh, big TV towers out on the west side of town, we fly by it at a safe distance, of course. Um, in the summertime, you might see that we're level with the top of it or even slightly above it. In the wintertime, we go fly by at the exact same altitude indicated on our altimeter, but in cold temperatures, and we're looking up at the top. Hmm. So you can actually see that effect uh, in the real airplane. Cool. And uh, because of that, there are certain times where there's a, a uh, correction table now they actually show it here in figure 8-4, they have this correction table. In VFR flying, most people don't actually apply temperature corrections, which um, is sort of crazy when I think about it, because as I said, you can have pretty significant variations, and if you're at a very cold temperature, you can be, if you're looking at the, uh, the sectional chart, the map we use as pilots, it tells us where the tops of all the cell phone towers and TV towers are, but as you said, that doesn't, you know, those that are made of steel, they don't expand or contract very much. Not much. Um, so if you're in the wintertime and the, those pressure levels have contracted closer together, you, you're lower than you think you are, uh, you could be in trouble if you're flying down at low altitude and you don't do a temperature correction like this. Um, so that's something that I sort of think about when I'm flying around in the wintertime in Wisconsin here is... Uh, uh, doing some temperature corrections. So as I said here at figure 8-4 in the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, they have that correction table for you. We talked a little bit about the, uh, the airspeed indicator and how that works. They have a nice diagram here, figure 8-7, showing uh, that. Uh, and all of these work very similar with the little bellows and the gears driving the needle. But in this case, with the airspeed indicator, again, it's comparing the two pressures. It's comparing the pitot tube to the pressure from the static port we talked about. And as you say on the sheaf, those are right next to each other. But uh, it's comparing those two pressures. And uh, the ratio between those two gives us our speed through the air, our indicated airspeed, as we call it. Now, one thing to realize about uh, airspeed and the airspeed indicator in the airplane, since all it's doing is uh, comparing a ratio of two different pressures, um, as we go up in the atmosphere, the air gets thinner. So the, uh, the ratio of uh, two pressures to get a, a given speed uh, through the air changes a little bit as we mm -hmm. go up and the air gets thinner. So if the air, if down here at sea level, if the airspeed indicator says, say, uh, 80 miles an hour, uh, well, then we're going 80 miles an hour. But as we go up, uh, because the air is getting thinner, if, if we're up at, say, 10,000 feet and the airspeed indicator says 80 miles an hour, well, we then we're... going to go a lot faster to get to 80 miles an exactly. hour. Exactly. We're, we're actually going... Our actual speed is probably more like 100 miles an hour. And that, the, uh, the indicated airspeed or calibrated airspeed, which we'll talk about in a minute, to true airspeed. The true airspeed is the actual speed we're going through the air. And to get from the indicated airspeed to the true airspeed, uh, we have to do a little calculation, and that's where that slide rule computer can help and us. It had something to do with airspeeds on there. Yep, exactly. And that's, you can do that calculation on there. 
and that also varies somewhat with temperature. So obviously, as we, if we go up in altitude, the, temp the pressure decreases, but if we have warmer air, the, the uh, pressure also decreases. So uh, true airspeed is uh, calibrated airspeed, I'll talk about that in a moment, corrected for pressure and temperature. Okay? Calibrated airspeed is simply uh, the indicated airspeed that you read off the gauge corrected for errors in the aircraft's uh, pitot-static system. So every airplane, because of the pitot tube, has to be connected to the airspeed indicator through a you know, uh, series of tubes and connectors to connect to all the other instruments. Uh, that will introduce certain errors into the system just because of the fact that the tubing is going all over the place. It slows the air down. Slows the air down and also uh, as you as the angle of attack changes, we talked about angle of attack when we were talking about lift, well as the angle of attack changes, the if you're at a very high angle of attack that air is trying to go into the pitot tube but it's not going in straight. Yeah. So then that also introduces an error. So when you look most pilots operating handbooks will have a um, table in it to correct for those errors and that takes the indicated airspeed that you read off the gauge and turns it into calibrated airspeed which corrects for all those errors and then if you want true airspeed which is the actual speed that we're moving through the air you take that calibrated number that you figured out and you correct it for temperature and pressure using the E6B slide Do we have roll. that calibrated? Is that in the little chief book? I'm not sure if the chief uh, manual has that or not. It may be, okay. uh, I don't believe it does. Uh, again, older airplanes, sometimes the manuals are a little bit sparse on the information that they have in yeah, them. Yeah, there's not much in the chief manual. No. It's pretty small. And that manual is even more than what it originally came yeah. with. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a number of... Uh, different errors also that can be introduced into particularly the airspeed indicator if we have malfunctions in the pitot-static system. So different figures here, figure 8-9 through 8-11 uh, show different errors that we can get because of failures. So 8-9 here shows a uh, blocked pitot tube. So get like a p ice or a bug or something gets stuck in the pitot tube. Well now the air can't get in so now it's uh, the, uh, the static port is sensing ambient pressure, but uh, the pitot tube inlet is blocked, but they do have a little drain hole here to uh, allow water to escape so that it doesn't get into the mm -hmm. uh, pitot static system. But that also allows uh, pressure to equalize if it's blocked. So what will end up happening Show is zero the, the drain hole essentially becomes another static port. So you're comparing one static port to another so static port. Zero. You're reading zero because there's no difference. Uh, another thing that can happen is if you have a blockage uh, that goes downstream of the drain hole, well now the pitot tube, the air comes in the pitot tube, goes out the drain hole, but it can't get uh, past the drain hole because there's the blockage there. This is figure 8-10. Well now, whatever pressure, air pressure is in that line between where the blockage is and the uh, airspeed indicator is fixed. That pressure is not going to change. So now, the static port is uh, sensing ambient air pressure, right? And now you're comparing it to something that's essentially static. Well, what does that sound like we just talked about? The altimeter. Mm -hmm. Right, it has that bellows that is sealed, and it's comparing it to static pressure. Right. Well, if we have blockage in the line, well, now we just sealed the bellows on our airspeed indicator, so now it just became an altimeter. <laughs> and you, they show that if you start at, I think they show 100 knots here. If you climb, well, this shows 110. If you descend, now it's showing 90. So, with a blocked uh, pitot line, you essentially now have two altimeters. It's just that one is not uh, calibrated, calibrated in a scale that is useful to you. <laughs> and uh, finally, the, uh, the other type of uh, failure you can have with the, uh, the airspeed indicator is if you have a blocked static port. So if the static port is blocked, um, obviously the, uh, 
vertical speed indicator and the altimeter are only hooked to the static port so if that's blocked well now you've got a sealed bellows and you're comparing it to another sealed bellows so since those measure a change there's no change so the air the altimeter will just freeze in place mm -hmm. just not move and the vertical speed indicator will also freeze in place it just won't move so you don't know if you're climbing or descending you don't know what your altitude is because the the, uh, the line is blocked the airspeed indicator now is comparing a sealed bellows essentially to uh, high pressure air high pressure air coming in through the pitot tube but because it's comparing the high pressure air from the pitot tube to some uh, random value it will show you an indication but it won't really relate to anything because it's supposed to be comparing the would you have a way of knowing that not the only way you would know about it is if you notice that your altimeter is frozen uh -huh. if your altimeter and vertical speed indicators are both not working not moving then you can probably deduce that your airspeed indicator is going to be off as well the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, gyroscope so we talked about uh, the pedostatic instruments, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the next category we have is gyroscopic instruments, and these use gyroscopes within them. If you know something about gyroscopes, you know that uh, they don't like to be disturbed. So if you have a little toy gyroscope, if we were to put it on the table here, we don't have one with us, obviously, but if you put it on the table, it would sort of stand up, not fall over, right? Well, we use the same principle in these instruments we have a gyroscope in them they want to stay in the same orientation and that's how our uh, attitude indicator works that's also how our uh, if we have a gyro compass that's how that would work and we also have the turn coordinator or turn and bank indicator uh, and that would show uh, relative to the way the gyro is oriented uh, whether we're going left or right or up or down depending on which of these instruments you're looking at. So the first one to talk about is the uh, attitude indicator. So that has a gyroscope in it and if you that will show you pitch and roll information. So it's essentially another name for it is the artificial horizon because it looks like a little horizon you'll see mm -hmm. in figure 8-24 uh, here it's blue on the top, looks like the sky. It's brown on the bottom, looks like the ground. So if you look at that, it's essentially like having a little window in your instrument panel that you can look through to see which way is up. And if you're learning to fly in the clouds, uh, getting an instrument rating, uh, that is a very useful instrument uh, to help you determine whether you're right side up. And it also gives you pitch information. So it's the only instrument of the gyros that gives you uh, information about both pitch and bank. Uh, so if you pitch up, the horizon will move down. If you pitch down, the horizon will move up and it'll right. show you whether you're going up or so down. So does the chief have that stuff? Chief, I It's got the indicator, yep. but does it have the lines for the bank and the pitch? I believe it does, yeah. So the chief has an older one, which is just, it doesn't have the blue and the brown, it's just all black. It has lines. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a little bit harder to read, but I believe it does work. We'll, uh, if I remember right, it's way down on the left side by the yep. pilot side. It's, I, like, when we were flying, yeah, it's, like, it's like I would try and look yeah, down there, but I just like so I couldn't yeah, see it. It's like it was down, so far down away. Down by your left knee, it's it's, it's pretty uh, hard to not, use. Yeah, not not really useful. Yeah. Um, that's why I said, you know, back when the chief was built, they would just stick things wherever they fit. And nowadays, it's in a little bit more of a standard right. configuration, so it's, it's easier to read. Um, the, uh, the next instrument to talk about is the uh, gyro compass or the directional gyro. Uh, so that gives you information about your heading. So as you turn left or right, uh, that gyro compass will turn around. The gyro will stay in place and the gearing will cause the, uh, the card which shows direction to turn and mm -hmm. show you which direction you're going. So it's a lot smoother than the jumpy compass. A lot smoother. Than the it's jumpy like a compass. compass, but it sits this way and right. it rolls around. Right. But over time, with the directional gyro, uh, friction within the gyroscope 
will cause the gyro to drift a little bit. Mm -hmm. So as you fly along, that uh, directional gyro, the gyro compass, will slowly sort of drift. So every, depending on how much friction there is, how new the bearings are in that gyroscope, every maybe five minutes, 15 minutes, you'll have to uh, look at the magnetic compass and set that uh, gyro compass to it to make sure it's still accurate. Another instrument to talk about briefly is the turn coordinator or the uh, turn and bank indicator. Now these are interesting because uh, the earlier type, which I believe is what the chief has, it has this little vertical needle, sometimes people call it a needle and ball. Mm -hmm because it has a little ball level in the bottom mm -hmm. to tell us if we're using too much I know rudder, all about that. Not ball. enough rudder. Um, Usually not enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> the turn and bank indicator with that needle and ball, what that senses is the gyroscope is positioned such that it determines very much like the uh, gyro compass would, uh, it, it senses a rate of turn. Okay, so if you start turning, uh, the, the gyro will resist that, but in the turn and bank, it has a stop, so it can only go so far, right? Mm -hmm. So it'll go over to the side to indicate that you're turning in that direction, but because it can only go so far... It'll just it's not go. giving you a degree, it's just saying you're going right, right or left. Right, or left, yep. Um, now, so it's giving you rate of turn. How fast are you turning right or turning left? Now, eventually they... Uh, improve that slightly and call it a turn coordinator and what that has a little airplane symbol mm -hmm. and what that does it's interesting they turn the gyroscope 45 degrees so now it senses rate of turn left and right but it also senses rate of roll left and right mm. and the advantage so right the advantage of that is you noticed when we were flying last time how we were doing those rolls left and right but keeping the nose pretty much on a point well, the old style turn and bank indicator wouldn't indicate any turn because we're just going back and forth keeping the nose on keep point. Up. Well, it's not that it couldn't keep up, it's just that uh, because we're only rolling left and right, we're not turning. Oh, the left turn, and right. we're not, yeah. We're not just... turning, so it's not sensing anything. But because they turned the gyroscope 45 degrees, now it senses rate of turn and rate of roll. So if we had a turn coordinator and we rolled left and right, it would, it would still sense that as left and right. Mm -hmm. So it just makes it sense the turn a little bit sooner because if it responds only to rate of turn then you have to roll in and actually start turning before it'll indicate anything whereas if it responds to rate of roll as soon as you start rolling off level it'll show a it'll show a turn so it's more sensitive and it indicates more there's less delay in the instrument mm -hmm. that way and uh, so most newer airplanes will have the turn coordinator rather than the turn and slip indicator uh, that uh, is the older type of instrument that only indicates rate yeah. of turn. Um, and then finally, uh, to talk about the magnetic compass. So magnetic compass obviously is a very simple instrument. It's been used uh, in navigating on the ground and on ships for centuries. Um, it's just it's, a, it's essentially just a magnet on a thing that can turn a pivot. a pivot and it will align with the Earth's magnetic field. Now because the Earth's magnetic field is not very strong, it will pull the compass to north, but not real strong. So if you disturb it, it'll start wiggling around a bunch. And that can indicate that can introduce a bunch of errors. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things that will be on the uh, knowledge exam for the private pilot or recreational pilot if we end up going that way is uh, knowing how to correct for those errors. Now, in practice in the airplane, what I would recommend is that you just, uh, if you're going to make a turn and you want to know what direction you're going, you just, as you're straight and level, you note your, your uh, mm -hmm. heading. You turn, stop turning, give it a second to settle down, and look at it again. That's the easiest way to use the magnetic compass is just don't try to... Don't try and follow it. Don't try to follow it. Don't don't try to compensate for the errors. Just let the errors settle out and then read it. So if you're making a 90-degree turn from, say, north to east, yep. so you, you're going straight north, and you go, you're going to turn east 90 degrees, make a right yep. turn. 
do you physically look out there and find a landmark that's 90 degrees and you turn and when you see that coming close you you level out and yep. then so tweak it a little bit that's kind of in, a good way to in do it vfr flying i would just uh pick up as you say pick a point outside and just aim for it one nice thing around this part of the world is we have a lot of uh, straight lines between fields mm -hmm. and those are oriented directly north south and directly east west so if you turn exactly to a line with those tree lines you know that you're going to be headed one of those one four of directions, those four directions. <laughs> uh, and that makes things much easier um, but in order to uh, be pilots in order to pass the knowledge exam we do have to know about those errors mm -hmm. so one error that we definitely have to know about, but uh, we don't have to worry too much about right around here, is magnetic variation. So this comes from the fact that the North Pole geographically, so the point that the Earth rotates around, and the magnetic North Pole They're in different spots. are in different spots. The magnetic North Pole wanders around the Arctic Ocean by several hundred miles. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if those... If you're in a point where the magnetic North Pole is directly between you and the actual North Pole, then those two are in a line. You don't get any uh, difference in the indications, right? But if you're somewhere else and the magnetic North Pole is not not directly between you anymore, it's off to say off to the left. Well, now your compass is going to point off to the left, point off towards where the magnetic North Pole is instead of mm -hmm. towards where the Earth is actually centered. Um, and the difference between the, uh, what's called true north, pointing to the point that the Earth rotates around, and magnetic north, where the magnetic field is centered, uh, is called magnetic variation. And that, de that varies depending on where you are on the Earth, because as I say, if you're in a place where, uh, from your point of view, the magnetic pole and the actual pole line up with each other, there's not going to be much variation. If you're in a place where they're Way off. off to the side, there's going to be a lot. Now, we're lucky enough here in Wisconsin that the magnetic pole is pretty much directly between yeah, us. Looking that map and the, there and on the 820, 833, pole. I was trying to, with my glasses to yep. see as best I could, and it looks like the well, zero line goes right through Wisconsin. Uh, it's, a little, it's pretty darn close. The zero line has moved. It used to be out in Lake Michigan. Now it's out in Iowa somewhere, but we're still, close pre enough. still pretty close. We're only one or two degrees off. So the uh magnetic variation around this part of the country is pretty small you can see if you get out towards um the west coast you can get holy smokes like really fif flies. 15 20 degrees of you have to add variation and that's why when you go out there uh you might have a runway that's pointed directly north and instead of say you know around here directly north would be three runway three six for 360 degrees or directly north but out there, you could have a runway that's going directly north, uh, north south, true, so pointing at the actual north pole of the Earth, but it might be numbered, say, runway 3 4 because, because you're 20 degrees off. The, the, uh, so that runway is by the magnetic compass then. Runways Just always because that's what's in the plane. Runways go by magnetic, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Another thing to uh, know about is magnetic deviation and magnetic deviation is just basically an error in the compass very much like we talked about the error in the pedostatic system mm -hmm. with the airspeed the compass in the airplane has errors too and that's usually because of things in the airplane that are magnetic so um, magnetic stuff, parts radios. of parts of radios steel tubes that may have been worked on with an electric tool that got magnetized yeah um, things like that and that can throw the compass off so uh, one of the things that happens when the airplane goes in for maintenance is they check for that and they check to see what the how much error is in the compass and they write all that stuff down on a card and stick it somewhere in the airplane. Do we have one of those on the chief? I believe we do. Cool. If we don't, we need to make sure it does have one because it is required. With northerly and southerly turning errors, um, because the... Uh, because of the way that the compass card is mounted, as you uh, as you roll the airplane left or right, so let's say um, you are 
let's say we're headed west. Okay. And we we roll the airplane to the left. Mm -hmm. Well, now the compass is, uh, has rolled to the left with the airplane. <clears throat> and as the compass has rolled, because the pivot has a certain mounting point on the compass, it's now a little bit off center. So the magnetic field of the Earth pulls mm. the compass a little bit sideways to compensate for the fact that it's now tilted relative to the Earth's magnetic field. And uh, as we <clears throat> do that, so uh, there's a figure here, figure 8-36, shows that uh, the compass will swing north or south depending on uh, which way we roll the airplane. So I, I give an example here that uh, depending on where your latitude is, how far north or south of the equator, the equator you are, obviously that because the Earth is a sphere, I think we can all agree on that at this point, <laughs> um, the uh, the angle that you're at relative to the Earth's magnetic field is different. So they say to stop the turn uh, 15 degrees plus half the latitude. So for 40 degrees north, half the latitude plus 15, 35 degrees prior to the desired heading you should roll out. Um, for northerly or southerly, uh, I believe is the, uh, yeah, it's just the same uh, in reverse, basically. Um, now there's a there's a saying to remember this. <clears throat> um, if you're turning to the south, uh, the what I like to uh, the mnemonic I like to use is uh, never overturn or surely overturn. So if you're turning north, never overturn. So roll out early. Okay. Right. <clears throat> uh, because the compass will then catch up. If you're turning to the south, S south surely overturn. So turn a little bit past, if you're going to the south, turn a little bit past your heading because then the compass will... Come if you're back. watching the compass. If you're watching the compass, it'll come back okay. on you. So there are different mnemonics that you can use to remember, um, but the, that's the one that I was taught, that's the one I use. You can look up online. There's two or three others that people have come up with to remember. So we talked about northerly and southerly turning error. Um, the other kind is an acceleration error. So what this is getting at is um, if you are headed east or west and you accelerate the airplane, well, the, uh, the compass card is not uniform in mass throughout mm -hmm. all of its area. So if you accelerate, uh, the compass card will tend to shift to show you turning to the north. The, the uh, mnemonic they use is ANDS, accelerate north, decelerate south. So if you're headed, uh, say, east and you accelerate, the compass will show you turning north It'll or turning left. It'll spin a little bit, even though you're going straight. Even though you're going straight. And if you, de if you slow down, it'll uh, show you turning right or turning south. And that concludes chapter eight. The gyro, the gyro instruments. Yes. We don't have electric, so I'm assuming those gyros are driven off of vacuum hoses from the engine. In the chief, good question. Um, yeah, and I should have mentioned this. So usually gyros are either electric That's or there. vacuum. Um, obviously, in the chief, we don't have an electrical system, so they have to be vacuum. So there's little vacuum hoses running up to them, sort of. Most airplanes nowadays will have a vacuum pump, which is driven off the engine, ah. but the Chief does not have that. If you look on the left side of the airplane, you'll see a little Venturi. Oh, that's that thing sticking on the outside. Okay, on so the that's what drives the gyros. Sticking on the outside. So, so, so we talked about how in the carburetor you have that throat mm -hmm. that makes a Venturi. So that's causes, creating a suction that causes the, causes the air to move faster, and because of Bernoulli's principle, the air pressure goes down. Well, that venturi on the side of the airplane is doing the same thing, and it's sucking air out through that tube using uh, mm -hmm. venturi and Bernoulli's principle, and uh, creates enough vacuum or pressure to not, spin uh, the gyros up. Creates enough airflow through. So we really can't use the, those; don't come alive until we start moving down the runway. 
Correct. Uh, in the chief, I would not. I would say you'd have to be going about 60 miles an hour before those gyros would start to come alive. That's it for flight instruments today. What's going to be the next ground school? Ground lesson three. Uh, so, manuals and documents, weight and balance, and aircraft performance. And that's going to be mostly out of the POH. The that's air, the other book air, that I have. Aircraft pilots right. operate. Yeah, the weight and balance, I'm curious to see how, because there's some funky numbers and, and ratios and stuff in there. I want to see how that works, because well, I haven't even got there. Yep. I haven't even tried to go there by myself. Yeah. So Once you know how to set up the... Uh, Set up the sheet of paper, it uh, gets pretty easy to figure Yeah, it's it just out. a matter of plugging numbers in, and but it's I don't exactly. understand what those things mean, so I'm right. kind of interested in learning that. So, all right, so that is it for today. Thanks for watching, folks. Don't forget to uh, like and subscribe down there. Leave us some comments, and if you want to see the full version of this, make sure to go check out Flying Fiddler CFI on YouTube, and you can see the full, uh, th full uh, ground school class from instruments, aircraft instruments, and... Uh, the next video after this, I believe, is another flight. We just need to find some time and weather, right? Yep. Now, I don't know what we're going to learn on that one, but it should be fun. Yep. Weather information, radio communication, slow flight. I'm looking yep. forward to that. I've read about that. That looks fun. Yep. Power off stalls, hold my tummy in, <laughs> and steep turns. So yep. that should be a fun flight. So that will be the next video you see after this. So thanks for watching, folks, and we will see you next time.